working through the three main themes in the first letter of Peter, and in the last talk we looked at the salvation, which we need to have as a sure foundation when the pressure comes. We looked at the suffering and how to handle that. But the surprise in the letter is the emphasis on submission, on learning to give in, learning to accept what happens. But it's not just in relation to suffering that Peter emphasises this. He says, first of all, learn to submit to the authorities, the civic authorities. You are citizens, you are subjects, so honour the emperor, pray for the king, for the governors, whether national or local, Christians have a duty to be law-abiding citizens. And we should be known for that as those who are glad to pay their poll tax because it brought Jesus to Bethlehem to be born, but also <laughs> because we are paying for what we receive and we're glad to do it. Christians should not be among those grumbling about taxes. And we honour the authorities, should pray for them, and we should be known as loyal subjects. Now that does not mean that you do everything you're told. There is a limit to obedience to civic authorities, and it was Peter himself who once said, we must obey God rather than men, when he was told by the authorities to stop preaching Jesus in the streets. And he said, we must obey God rather than men. So there is a limit to submission, and that limit comes when the authority tells us to do anything immoral or illegal against the law of God, and so there are limits. But a Christian must be a loyal subject and should not be arrested because they are rebellious, because they're aggressive towards the authorities. You see, that's one of the first sources of the suffering from the civic authorities. Another source of early Christian suffering was for slaves from their unbelieving masters. That was a very difficult position because a slave was totally the property of his master. He had no money of his own, no time of his own, no rights of his own, and many of the masters treated their slaves abominably. And when the slaves became Christians, the masters treated them worse because they thought their slaves were getting too big for themselves and must be kept down. And he says, slaves, submit to your masters. Learn to give in. Don't fight it. Don't become aggressive or resentful towards it. And even, he says, the harsh masters, not just the good ones. You know, some people believe in submission provided the person you're submitting to is a good person. But he said, no, even the harsh masters. Then thirdly, another great source of suffering was Christian wives of unconverted husbands. And that is a very <coughs> difficult situation and causes great heartache. Wives, be subject to your husbands, even the unbelieving ones. And in fact, Peter gives great advice on how to win your unconverted husband for Christ. And it's totally contrary to what we tend to do. When a wife is converted before the husband, she thinks the two things that she must do now is first of all, preach at him, and secondly, pray for him and preferably pray with all the other converted wives for all the unconverted husbands. Peter says neither. In fact, he says if you preach, it's the worst thing you can do. He says you've got to win him without a word. And so many Christian wives go home after church and say, you should have been in church tonight. That pastor might have been just going through your life, <laughs> you know? And um, most Christian wives, after about three months, regret having preached to their husbands. You do it without a word. Well, how do you do it? The answer is, Peter says, become more attractive to look at and more attractive to live with. That's a simple program for Christian wives. Become more attractive to look at. He says a lot about appearance. There's a beauty column in chapter 3 of 1 Peter. How to become beautiful. Not how to be glamorous, but how to be beautiful. Glamour belongs to the under-40s, beauty belongs to the over-40s. <laughs> I'm serious. 
The most beautiful woman I ever knew was a Miss Harris. She was 84 when I met her. She had enough lines on her face to supply a British telecom with all their <laughs> wires. But anyway, I said to her, do you mind my saying, Miss Harris, you've got the most beautiful face. And her response was surprising. She said, you're not the first man to have told me that. <laughs> then she said this, when I was young, I was so plain, so ugly. I never got a date. I never got asked to dance at the school dance. But she said, when I was 27, I fell in love with Jesus. And she said, for the next week, I was up in the clouds. In fact, she said, I was so happy that he loved me. I said to him, please, Jesus, take the joy away, or I'll trust the joy rather than you. I've had so many Christians pray that God would take the depression away. She was the only one I've ever known, take the joy away. But she said, you know, you get to be like the people you love. She said, that's how I got this face. I'll never forget that. Dear Miss Harris, she'd got the beauty secret from 1 Peter chapter 3. See, that means the older you get, the more beautiful you can get. Good news? <laughs> right. You may leave your glamour behind, but what's glamour? Well, now, he says, become more attractive to look at and more attractive to live with. And your husband will say, I got a better wife from Jesus. But you know what many husbands say? Jesus ran off with my wife. It doesn't belong to me anymore. And it's very important that wives learn to go with, with their husbands. But far too many women go to coffee mornings and Bible studies and they become spiritual racehorses while their husband is still at the starting post. And he feels less and less the head of the house. Can I just throw a bit of practical advice in? I was down in South Wales and a lady came up to me and she said, I have a problem. I said, uh, do you have a husband as well as a problem? She said, yes. I said, is your husband your problem? She said, no. I said, well, have you been to your husband with your problem? She said, no. Well, why not? Why come to me? She said, he's not a believer. It's a spiritual problem. I said, but why didn't you go to him with it? She said, don't you understand? He's an unbeliever. He's not got that much interest in spiritual things. How can I take a spiritual problem to him? I said, it's easy. Just go to him and tell him the problem. I said, all you need is a little bit of faith that God will speak to you through your husband. But how can he? He's an unbeliever. I said, listen, God once spoke to a man through his donkey. <laughs> See? And if God can speak to a man through his donkey, God can speak to you through your husband. Now, nine women out of ten accept that argument and laugh, which shows me what they really think of their husband, you see. But um, She was the tenth and she was very angry and she went away and for a whole month she was angry with me and she said, don't go to David with Paulson with a problem. He's unsympathetic if you're not married to a believer. But 18 months later, I'm down in the same lower western valley and there she is again. She came up she said, I've got another problem, Mr. Paulson. But she says, it's my husband this time. I said, oh, what's your problem? She said, what do you do with a husband who's way ahead of you spiritually? <laughs> I said, are you serious? She said, very serious. He's at the back of the meeting. I said, what happened? She said, for a whole month I was angry with you and then I went to my husband in desperation, told him the problem. He gave me the answer. He said, I don't know who was more surprised, him or me. <laughs> but he began to get interested from that day. Now he's a believer. But he said, she's run so fast to catch, he's run so fast to catch me up, he's gone shooting right past me. And he said, he's way up. She said, I don't like him, he's way up here now. I said, you know your problem. You're the manipulator in that partnership. You didn't like him back here, you don't like him up here, you want him just here, where you are. You learn to be alongside him. I've told wives who've said to me, how can I get my husband saved? I've said, stop going to church. They say, no, seriously, how can I get my husband converted? I said, I was serious. It's amazing how many husbands have started coming to church because their wife stopped. See? And Peter is very wise in this. He said, wives, you bring unnecessary suffering on yourself because you're getting further and further away from your husband. But when your husband says, I got a much better wife from Jesus, she's much better looking now. She's much easier to live with now. He's much more likely to come. Well, Peter knew he was married and he understood these things. Then there's a fourth uh, area of submission. It's not an area of suffering, this fourth one, so he separates it from the other three and brings it in the last chapter. He says, younger, submit to older. And he said, learn to give way to older people. 
to look to them for leadership. You see, one of the punishments of Israel in the, the prophet Isaiah had to announce was that because they wouldn't go God's way, they would be ruled by women and exploited by youth. Well, what a sentence. It's not irrelevant to our situation either. Ruled by women and exploited by youth. Whereas in normal godly society, older men are looked to. And <coughs> Peter says, you younger men, respect the elders. Now, in all this, he's not saying blind submission. And where blind submission is demanded by human authorities, that's going to set up real tension. But it's an attitude. And what Peter's saying is in all these areas of life, develop the attitude of not fighting back, of not retaliating, of not being aggressive, of not asserting yourself or your rights. Because that's a whole attitude which will mean that when the suffering comes, you won't be able to handle it. So get ready now. I once said to a dear saint who I've always looked up to, he's elderly now and living on the south coast, I said, Bob, I don't think I could ever face the lions for Jesus. And you know, as an older man, he said a wise thing. He said to me, David, if you are faithful in the little battles now, he will give you the grace when the big crunch comes. That was wise. I've never forgotten what he said because uh, he's an elder and I looked to him and it was wise advice. So develop this attitude. Have this foundation, develop this attitude, and when this comes, you'll be able to handle it. Now there's just one problem with 1 Peter. There's a very obscure passage which has, I'm told, 314 different interpretations. <laughs> now better mention it because if you read it through, you'll understand all the epistle except this bit. And it says something well, I've got a whole chapter in my book on hell on it, so you can read that chapter for an exposition of this little bit. But it says something about Jesus being put to death in the body and made alive in the spirit in which he went and preached to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah's flood. And then a few verses later he says, this is why the gospel was preached even to those who were dead, that they might be saved in their spirits. And I'm afraid on the basis of this passage, liberal preachers have based their doctrine of a second chance of the gospel after death, which every other scripture says is impossible. Death seals our fate. There's a great gulf fixed beyond death. But here apparently Jesus did preach. And I find that the trouble with the, all the many interpretations is that people are trying to get round the simplest, plainest meaning of it because it, it is an awkward passage to fit in with the general teaching of the scripture that death is the end of your opportunity of salvation. And yet if you take it at its face value, and I always start by taking scripture in its simplest, plainest sense and only changing that if it really is difficult. And in its simplest, plainest sense, it says that between his death and resurrection, Jesus was active, conscious, and actually communicating with others who were also fully conscious and communicating with him. Now, of course, you never hear about this in church because all Holy Week services finish on Friday and start up again on Sunday. So you're never told what Jesus was doing on the Saturday, right? But you see, we tend to think of Jesus doing nothing between his death and resurrection, being just unconscious, inactive in the tomb. But it says only his body was dead, but his spirit was very much alive. And he went to the world of the dead and he was preaching. I can imagine Peter meeting Jesus on the first Easter Sunday. We know he met Peter. We don't know where, we don't know when, we don't know what was said, but I'm imagining now, but I think I'm not far off. I think Jesus. Peter said, Jesus, where on earth have you been? And Jesus said, I haven't been on earth, I've been in Hades, Sheol, the world of the departed. But what on earth have you been doing? For, sorry, what in Hades have you been doing for three days and three nights? Actually, it was three days and three nights. Jesus died on the Wednesday afternoon. All the evidence points there. 
uh, we've been fooled because he died the day before the Sabbath, but it was not the Saturday Sabbath. John's Gospel says, now that Sabbath was a special high Sabbath, and the Passover began with the Sabbath. And in the year AD 29, which is almost certainly the year Jesus died, the 15th of Nisan, the first day of the Passover, was on a Thursday and was the Sabbath. And the Wednesday would be the 14th, the eve of the Passover. Well, that's just my theory, but it fits all the evidence better than all the other theories. It doesn't matter really what day Jesus died on, he died for you. That's the important thing. But he said it would be three days and three nights, and you cannot fit that in between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning. But if he died at three o'clock on the Wednesday, and he rose between 6 p.m. and midnight on the Saturday, every bit of the Gospel evidence fits. And of course, 6 p.m. on the Saturday evening was the first day of the week. We will think in terms of Roman calendar instead of Jewish calendar. But that was the first day of the week, and long before dawn the tomb was empty. Well, that's just an aside. But if, if you don't accept that theory, you will have problems with some of the data in the New Testament. It does all fit. There is a way to see round these contradictions or apparent contradictions. But leave that aside. What was he doing for three days and three nights? And Jesus must have told Peter, I've been preaching. Who to? All those who were drowned in Noah's flood. Now that means that those who were drowned in Noah's flood were also conscious. You will be fully conscious one minute after you're dead. You will know who you are. You will have your memory. It's only your body that dies, not your spirit. Death separates body and spirit. Later, spirit and body will be reunited in the resurrection, but much later for us. But Jesus went through all three phases in less than a week. He was an embodied spirit until he died on the cross. Then he commended his spirit to God and his body was put in a tomb. Alive in the spirit, he went and preached to those disobedient people from Noah's flood. And then his body and spirit were reunited on Easter Sunday morning. But he was fully conscious and able to communicate all the way through. That's very, very important. It's only the sects who teach soul sleep in between the two bodies. That's another story. Now then, if we take that at face value, it does mean that Jesus went and preached the gospel to that particular generation and only to them. And it does clearly imply that it was a gospel that could save them and redeem them. So, isn't this a second chance after death? I'm prepared to say, yes, it is, for them and for them only. There is no hint in the Bible that anyone else would ever have such an opportunity. So why should it be given to them and them alone? And what I'm going to say now is pure speculation. Now don't blame me if you don't believe it. It's just my guess. When I get to heaven, I'll, I'll check it up and then I'll tell you whether I was right or wrong. <laughs> but this is my guess. There was one generation who could accuse God of being unjust and unfair. You wiped us out and then promised never to do it again. And I believe God, to cover his justice and his righteousness, said, Son, just go and tell them the gospel. I won't have anyone in the day of judgment accusing me of treating anybody unfairly. Well, that's my guess, but I know a God of righteousness who bends over backwards not to be unfair not to have favourites, and maybe that's why. But I believe it's better, rather than to try and twist Scripture to fit our system, to accept it in its simplest, plainest value, but limit it to what it says. And there is no ground here for a second chance for anyone else, what Alfred Lord Tennyson, whose centenary we celebrate this year, called the larger hope the hope that we'll all get a chance after death. That's universalism, and that's not taught in the Scripture.